Hi everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are finally wrapping up our seventh unit in the class in AP Biology on Natural Selection by diving into topic 7.13, Origins of Life on Earth. Now this is a doozy here. This is a really, really interesting topic um, because it really, you know, what it provides an answer based in science to some of life's largest questions. Like for, the, for example, this one, why are we here? How did we end up this way? Some questions that people spend lifetimes thinking about and we've spent generations asking each other. Right? There's, some, there's some answers that are provided, hopefully that you've learned about through this unit, talking about natural selection and evolution. Um, and here's another kind of kind of answer based in science um, as to like why is life here? How did life end up? on planet Earth and why are we here? Um, so I'll be honest with you, we don't know for sure. We have several competing hypotheses about how life began, um, which are you know based in geological evidence, but we don't know for sure how life began um, or how inorganic molecules suddenly became organic molecules and how organic molecules became living things. And it begs the question, what even is a living thing? So hopefully we'll gain a little bit of insight into um, the competing hypotheses as to how life began on Earth. Uh, so some things that we absolutely do know that are not hypotheses is that, you know, Earth is 4.6 billion years old and life began at least 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, we know this based on radiometric dating. We know this. This is a fact, okay? 4.6 billion years old, that's how Earth is, how, that's how old Earth is. There's no debating that. It's been, it's been essentially proven. I like to say all the time that science doesn't aim to prove, but this has been, this has been shown many times to be true. Okay, um, so here's a picture of what early Earth might have looked like around the time that life began. Uh, it wasn't blue yet because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Oxygen in the atmosphere didn't come about until about 3 billion years ago thanks to cyanobacteria splitting water to make oxygen. We learned about that in our photosynthesis uh, topic back in Unit 3. Um, but here's what we do know. Here's something else that we do know. Earth was too hostile for life until about 3.9 billion years ago. Okay, so Earth had a very, very violent history. The first, you know, 700 million years of its existence, accretion was occurring and lots of rocks were crashing into Earth thanks to gravity. And that made it really unsuitable for life. The whole floor was lava. Okay, you know, that, play, that game that you play when you're a little kid, like, the floor is lava, you can't touch it, and you got to jump around on the furniture, right? It's like the whole floor was lava around the planet, which is pretty incredible. Um, but there's no way that life could have formed there. Okay, uh, so when so when water was introduced, you know, hydrogen and oxygen reacted with each other, or water was perhaps even brought over by uh, via meteorites from other from other planets. That's a possibility too. Um, that's when life became more suitable. And our oldest fossils are 3.5 billion years old. So we know that life began somewhere between 3.9 and 3.5 billion years ago. Okay, that, that is very well supported, and that's not necessarily a hypothesis. That is well supported fact. Um, yeah, it's a large range. I mean, if you think about it, 400 million years, but it's the best we got. All right, uh, now let's actually get into the hypotheses here. So this, uh, this hypothesis was developed independently by two separate scientists in like the 1920s. Um, so the op operin haldane hypothesis suggests that Earth's early atmosphere allowed for organic compounds to form from simpler inorganic compounds. Okay, so basically what we can say is that, you know, uh, organic molecules like carbohydrates and lipids and uh, nucleotides and maybe some amino acids were able to form from molecules like, say, water, methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, that kind of stuff. Um, those molecules are all made of the same four atoms that really make up organic molecules. And in one way or another, those inorganic molecules were able to form organic molecules that living things actually use. Okay? And they uh, suggested that the energy for these reactions to occur, because those are 
you know, those are anabolic reactions, taking smaller ones and building bigger ones. Uh, they came from that, that energy to do that came from lightning or from UV radiation. Um, and so before I get too further into uh, the, the, excuse me, the operand Haldane hypothesis, let's just take a sidebar quick here. So where did those inorganic compounds or even the organic molecules come from? Some evidence suggests that meteorites transported organic molecules to Earth, and perhaps some very, some very recent hypotheses suggest that life itself was even brought to the planet via meteoroids, which is meteorites, excuse me, which is uh, really amazing to think about. Uh, maybe life began somewhere else and it was accidentally transported to this planet. Um, but anyway, it has been proven once again that meteorites have contained, that we have landed to Earth um, in the last, you know, since we've been studying them, have contained amino acids and other organic compounds, which are precursors to life. Okay, so that's suggesting that, all right, maybe some organic compounds, maybe they weren't spontaneously formed, maybe they were brought over from space, which is opens up a whole nother can of worms. All right, but anyway, back to Opera and Haldane here. Um, the Yuri Miller experiment was a very famous experiment that proved complex organic molecules like carbohydrates, lipids, amino acids, and nucleotides can form from inorganic compounds. They, so they basically proved that, you know, Operin and Haldane were on the right track, that inorganic compounds can become organic compounds. So they set up this experiment um, using electrodes and using basically uh, simulated lightning and some gas like methane and ammonia with some water, and they were able to make organic compounds using this, uh, this simulated experiment, okay? It's, so, like I said, that supports the operand Haldane hypothesis, although um, the atmosphere wasn't likely the same as what operand Haldane thought it would be, and uh, having a different atmosphere is a, called a reducing atmosphere. They, operand Haldane thought it was a reducing atmosphere. Um, might not have actually been the case, so maybe the gases in this, uh, in this scenario were not exactly similar to uh, what early Earth's atmosphere was like. Um, so that might change a few things. Okay? But again, we got, we're getting closer to this answer. Um, all right, but the gist of it here is that inorganic molecules formed organic monomers and organic monomers formed organic polymers. Okay, So what we've talked about so far is how inorganic molecules can form organic monomers, but what about this second part where they form organic polymers? Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, one last piece of the um, Opper and Haldane hypothesis says that proteins and nucleic acids clustered together and lipids formed vesicles surrounding them in the pools at the ocean's edge. That was the last piece of their, uh, their collective hypothesis was that the, once these inor or organic molecules formed, they could cluster together and thus that formed the first living thing. And uh, where they suggested this would happen would be in pools at the ocean's edge, kind of like this one a little bit. I couldn't find the, the best picture, um, but it would be pools at the ocean's edge. Obviously, there wouldn't be any grass or any moss or anything like that because, you know, those hadn't evolved yet. Um, but there's n even newer evidence that's suggesting that, mm, you know, it probably didn't happen on the surface because of the sun's UV radiation. UV radiation can be pretty damaging. Um, and that it didn't happen there, and it actually happened at the bottom of the ocean, where the UV radiation couldn't have penetrated um, down to the depths of the ocean. And the precursors, the inorganic precursors for living things that eventually became organic monomers and polymers came from hydrothermal vents. Okay, this is kind of like, uh, like this one. It just kind of look, looks like black smoke. Um, and this is a result of um, plate tectonics and... and uh, excuse me, compounds coming up from the mantle and breaking through uh, to the surface. So this is the primordial soup, so as it's called, at the bottom of the ocean. So this, this uh, hypothesis about where my life might have began is gaining more traction. It's probably not going to be these uh, pools, but it's going to be more likely at the bottom of the ocean, which is incredible if you think about it. Uh, all right, but back to that piece about how organic monomers can form organic polymers, okay? 
Um, there are there have been some experiments that in recent years, I believe the most recent one was in like 2009, the most famous one, successful one. Uh, it suggests that monomers, like say your nucleic acid or excuse me, nucleotides and amino acids, can spontaneously form polymers under the right conditions. So those nucleotides, those building blocks of uh, nucleic acids can link together and form like RNA. And amino acids can spontaneously form proteins, which is also very crazy. Okay? This, uh, this special type of clay is called montmorillonite. Um, that tends to catalyze nucleotides into RNA, which is, again, this stuff blows my mind, um, that on a certain type of surface, on a substrate, this can catalyze the uh, formation of a polymer, an RNA polymer from nucleotides. Okay? Um, so that is once again suggesting that you know organic monomers formed organic polymers uh, spontaneously. Okay, but once these once these organic polymers they are they're clustered together, whether that's at the bottom of the ocean or in the um, in the ocean ocean front pools like uh, Opper and Haldane suggested, the first cells were likely what we call proto cells, and in fact proto means first. Um, and all they really were are droplets with membranes that contained an internal chemistry different from that of their surroundings. Okay, so you might be wondering how would lipids know to be able to do this and form a membrane? Well, really, lipids like soap and, well, just, yeah, think of soap. Soap has got lots of lipids in it. It forms bubbles, okay? Lipids tend to form vesicles and form bubbles by themselves without any other influence, okay? So it's very, very possible that these lipids, you know, this self-replicating RNA or these, these chemical reactions were able to just occur in a bubble, a lipid bubble like this. And thus, that's a living thing. If it's able to metabolize, it's able to make things react with each other um, for the benefit of the, well, the rest of the cell, and it's able to replicate its own DNA and pass that down, or excuse me, not DNA, it would be RNA, and pass that down, that's a living thing, all right? So that's a, a very strong suggestion of what the first living things were. Basically, just a bubble. And what what was in that bubble first? Was it self-replicating RNA, or was it a series of metabolic reactions? Okay. So there are two more hypotheses that we're going to discuss. What was in that bubble? The RNA world hypothesis states that RNA was the first genetic material, and RNA came before metabolism. Right, so RNA catalysts called ribozymes were allowed RNA to self-replicate if the nucleotide building blocks were available to make more RNA with it. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of the RNA world hypothesis is that uh, nucleotides were able to um, form longer RNA molecules and the infolding, since RNA is only one strand, um, the infolding of RNA was able to allow it to self-replicate. Um, and once it was in this bubble, you know, that's a living thing. Okay, so that's the RNA world hypothesis. And the last piece that we're going to talk to about here is the metabolism first hypothesis. Okay, so before RNA was even formed, uh, there were a series of complex chemical reactions that allowed these organic, uh, these organic precursor molecules to form the larger, more complex molecules like nucleic acids, like RNA, and for perhaps proteins. Okay, so this is the metabolism first hypothesis. The networks of chemical reactions came before uh, self-replicating nucleic acids or nucleic acids at all. Okay, uh, so that is it for Unit 7. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions and we will see you for Unit 8. Bye.